It's time for a deep dive on University of Portland basketball. This is home for me, and so to be able to uh, take on this challenge and bring the city in with the rest of the UP family, I'm very excited about that. The inside story on the pilots. In order for us to get to where we want to go, we want to always make sure we protect our home court. We want to compete. We want to play hard on our opponent. We want to play together. Last thing, guys, let's enjoy the moment. This is the Terry Porter Show, brought to you on 910 ESPN Portland by your local Les Schwab Tire Center, by U.S. Bank, Coca-Cola, by Nike, Alaska Airlines, Geico, by AAA Oregon, and by Mart. Now here's the voice of the pilots, Jason Swigard. Well, good evening. Welcome in all. As uh, it seems like Coach Porter and I do one of these shows now every year. It's the snow show. As uh, we're worried Coach uh, might get hung up. Don't want him out there uh, in his nice ride uh, spinning off the road. So, He's curled up with, uh, I'm sure you got a fireplace, a nice uh, mug of hot cocoa, some marshmallows there, Coach. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you. <laughs> it seems, it's yeah, nice it's, to have the fireplace. <laughs> I know. Seems like we're doing one of these once a year. We, we just can't avoid the weather issues. I know. I know. It's crazy. We think this is supposed to be a, somewhat of a mild winter place for us, but it's not. We always get caught. At least we haven't got caught on the airplane and at the terminal yet. No, no. Thank goodness. Uh, travel issues uh, have been, well, relatively benign uh, this season. Not uh, not completely void, but uh, relatively benign. As uh, we got Coach on the horn here for the next hour, uh, we can still take your phone calls at 503-542-0910 or 877-535-9100 as uh, we'll work through uh, the games last week. Tough one at home to Pepperdine, and then, oh, what almost was at Santa Clara uh, as a furious uh, finish in regulation allowed the guys to get to overtime, but uh, they ran out of some gas and some steam there uh and so we'll break those games down and and talk about some of the the storylines that have come out of the week um trying to build on that momentum from santa clara and making sure uh, the guys are uh understanding that the progress that they are making in practice and, and with these games is getting them to a tipping point also uh with coach we want to get his thoughts we've heard a lot about from from college football the transfer portal as it is now referred to uh, but it's also about to be a huge issue with college basketball. Most schools are into their uh, spring semesters or final quarters, and some players are starting to assess uh, whether they want to stick it out, go somewhere, if there's better opportunities, if they don't think they're getting a fair shake, and it really could create a lot of chaos uh, in this summer. And so we'll get uh, Coach Porter's uh, kind of take on what how crazy uh, that is going to be and then of course we'll look ahead to uh, this week portland at home all week long byu and lmu in byu that'll be a late thursday night game in loyola marymount uh, on saturday evening and that'll be a military appreciation night well at the child center so we'll get to all of that first but coach uh, we'll look back at last week, and uh, Pepperdine was just one of those things where uh, if it weren't for bad luck, you might not have had any luck at all. Uh, the Waves came in, started on a 10-0 run, uh, had a 17-1 run there uh, midway through the first half, and uh, they decided to take Marcus Shaver Jr. out, force somebody else uh, to come up with the offense, and it was a struggle all night. Yeah, it really was. We uh, we struggled to get into an offensive rhythm, and you have to give them some credit for that. But, again, we had some opportunities early on to try to get us into a rhythm, and unfortunately we weren't able to, uh, you know, make those shots and make those plays for us. And they they penalized. They took, well, they took advantage of some of our mistakes and our turnovers and got out an open court and made some shots and, uh, and really built that big lead. And from that point on, it really was a struggle for us to get back into that game. It was the first time we really saw a team come out and and take the mentality of uh, we're going to put a blanket around Marcus Shaver Jr. Teams have tried to do it. They've tried to double team or whatever, but he's always uh, found a way to to find his offense as the game went on. But they were just uh, hedging on all those screens out high, all those ball screens, really not letting them have any room to operate uh, what? How did you assess what Pepperdine did that was maybe different from some of the other defensive approaches on Marcus? Well, I, I, what their main pur- purpose was to really just not to let him <clears throat> get in any type of rhythm offensively. 
whenever he was involved in a pick and roll, they basically double teamed him and then brought even over a third defender to make sure he wasn't able to get to the rim and get any type of driving lanes and, and be able to, uh, you know, draw fouls. And uh, they did a good job early on. Also, when he did drive it, they were able to step in and get some charges, and that kind of got him, you know, got him on his heel, got him in early foul trouble. But, uh, you know, all in all, um, you know, when that happens, you need other guys to kind of make shots and make plays. And so, um, you know, we just haven't been able to have that second or third score uh, kind of step up when we needed someone to step up and really kind of carry the, carry the load for us offensively yet. And Pepperdine, uh, under a new head coach, a returning head coach, I should say, Lorenzo Romar, uh, not going very deep. Uh, he's got a lot of freshmen uh, that he's working in, but a few reliable guys in Cameron Edwards, Colby Ross, Eric Cooper Jr. Uh, to rely on. And as he builds his core, uh, this Pepperdine team, certainly one that uh, could pose some problems for people when we get to Vegas in the West Coast Conference Tournament. Well, they have a good mix of upperclassmen, uh, you know, you mentioned that, which you mentioned uh, uh, the shooter Cooper Jr. I mean, those guys have been around. And then you mentioned the, the young fellow Ross who's had an unbelievable sophomore year and has really continued to get better and better. And the other pieces have just kind of found their little spots here and there in their role. And so they could be a team that, you know, can maybe knock somebody off because they have the upperclassmen experience, they have the shooting, and they're able to uh, – you know, they're not the tallest team, but they're able to really do a good job in regards to finding the post and not allowing teams to really, uh, you know, get into uh, the lane and really get a lot of easy opportunities. Uh, then second half, uh, things just uh, kind of got out of hand. It gave you an opportunity, though, to, to get some of the uh, guys that haven't seen a lot of playing time in there. Uh, Taki LaFerenson, uh, Xavier Hallinan got some run. Um uh, to you know, play the string out. How important is it for guys like that who I know have been uh, you know really performing well in practice to get on the court, get just more comfortable when the lights are on uh, in case you need them, injury, foul trouble, who knows what's going to happen here in the second half of the season. How important is work like that for those guys? Well, whenever they get a, an opportunity to get into uh, a game and get some, some live reps is very important. So you know, Taki, again, someone that we need to, uh, you know, we start sprinkling him in here uh, in these games to try to content, get him some consistent, you know, minute stretches, maybe, you know, get him on the floor, see how he see how he does. Um, he's someone who we got to try to start creeping in and give him an opportunity and see what he can do because you said he's been pretty decent in practice, making shots and making plays. And, uh, you know, you know what you're going to get for X all the time. You know, he, he competes hard and, really does a good job of running the show and trying to get the ball to the right guy. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you talk about game kind of getting out of hand the way it did, it was good to you like to kind of reward those guys who, uh, you know, doing everything they can in practice and just waiting for an opportunity. So Pepperdine, uh, that an 83-58 final. We uh, hop on the plane, head back to a, a stormy central uh, California coast there and get ready for Santa Clara that came in. They had a tough one uh, the night before as well, or on Thursday, uh, where they couldn't hold a first-half lead against Loyola Marymount. And so uh, thought this this might be the opportunity, and it was the best start we've seen from the Pilots in quite some time, building an 18-9 to lead midway through the first half. Uh, what were the elements that stuck out to you uh, in seeing the team uh, build that lead early on? Well, early on, we were able to do some things we haven't done consistently, and that's turn people over and get out in open court and get some easy opportunities. We got some layups early on that really helped us kind of, again, gain some confidence and build some rhythm offensively. And then we did a good job defensively. You know, we didn't really allow them to get a lot of easy baskets. Um, you know, we found guys in transition, did a good job really on their on a couple of their guards early in the first half and uh, was able to uh, – you know, not, not let those guys get going. So that's where uh, it stemmed from early on, our ability to really get out in open court, get some easy baskets, and guys make some nice plays for us down the stretch I mean, in the first half. And then uh, it, it slowly started to slip away, and the one thing that, that still wasn't quite firing on all cylinders was the three-point shot, two of ten in that first half. And I know talking with some of the assistant coaches and uh, really felt like, 
you should have had a much larger lead than one point uh, there going into the break. Uh, what was your assessment there, like the final six or seven minutes in the first half? Yeah, you know, you play in those games like that, especially on the road, and you have a chance to really extend that lead, you know, get a bigger cushion because you know the home team is always going to make a run. And you, you try your best to try to make sure that you get as big a league as possible. We just, again, we couldn't, you know, couldn't get string some, some important um, plays together and some plays, some shots, and continue to build on that. And they made some plays, and we turned it over a little bit and allowed them to get back into the game. And so then they come out in the second half. They go on a uh, 12-2 run there. They build the lead up to 11. They're up 10 with a minute 41 to go. And uh, of all things, uh, coming out of nowhere, all of a sudden the three started to fall for the guys. Uh, they cranked up the defensive pressure. Uh, Santa Clara missed a couple of uh, free throws. And uh, Marcus hits the three with six seconds to go. Uh, managed to uh, – the the refs just uh, ate the whistles there in the final seconds. There was all – I think five guys fell down in the key when, when the red light went on the backboard. And fortunately, there was no whistle for you to get to overtime. Yeah, I mean, it um... – you know, it was just one of those things that, you know, you expect to happen on the road. But I thought uh, our guys did a great job of fighting once it got down. Still continued to show great resolve and fight. And uh, Marcus was able to hit, hit, hit a big shot and tie it and take it into uh, overtime for us. And, um, you know, in overtime, like you said, we just couldn't make enough plays. And, again, that whole second half, when I, I charted the, the game and we – didn't do a good job of finishing plays. We we're three for 15 for layups. And so, you know, we got to do a better job of being able to finish plays at the rim. Um, you know, we do a great job of getting there. And then we got to be able to finish those plays because on the road, when you're able to finish those type of plays, uh, they play a huge part in just giving you confidence and, um, you know, continue to put pressure on the home team. I know one of the things that uh, you had to battle with uh, throughout the game was foul trouble. Uh, JoJo picked up two early in the first half, and uh, Marcus had two, and then they were fighting with four fouls uh, down the stretch in the second half. Was there anything uh, different with those guys uh, in terms of, of – we've seen maybe one of them at times uh, you know, be real aggressive or have a real tough defensive assignment where you kind of expect maybe we got to watch out for fouls, but – I can't remember both of them being in, in such foul trouble throughout an entire game like they were. Yeah, I mean, I think you go on the road sometimes, you know, the close, you know, close 50, couple 50 50 calls didn't go our way and put those guys, you know, behind the eight ball a little bit, you know, second and third foul, especially early on. JoJo got his second foul early. Kind of just, again, it took away his aggressiveness and, uh, you know, he got tentative for us on us in regards to his ability to drive and, same in the second half, and they both kind of got in foul trouble. I, I don't think they did anything defensively any different than they did in the previous games up to that point. It's just, just one of those games where, uh, you know, a couple of them was could have been not a no call, but they decided to call them, and that put them, uh, it put them in uh, foul trouble. Well, I know, uh, you know, then just things just – just didn't go your way in the overtime. Uh, some late whistles after great defense. Uh, they Santa Clara was inside five seconds, I think, on the shot clock and just uh, initiated contract and got some whistles. They ended up getting to the free throw line, uh, some key misses, and, and it just looked like guys were gassed a little bit there that they just couldn't keep the momentum going into overtime. Well, yeah, you know, our, our guys did a good job of um, really defending most of the shot clock and then, like I said, a couple of close calls that uh, the whistle didn't go our way. And, and especially, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, low clock situations, four or five seconds on the clock, and you've done such a good job up to that point of really defending that particular possession. You hate to see a uh, whistle could be blown and give those guys, especially when they're already at the penalty or something, and they'd be able to knock free throws down. Uh, and that's, that's just really tough um, in regards to just um, – all your hard work and effort, and there you go in regards to them giving them like easy points. So we, uh, it was like you said, it was a couple possessions like that that just turned it around, and we just never recovered from it. So final score there, sixty nine, sixty three in overtime, 
And so uh, the question now, uh, we'll pick this conversation up after the break, building on that momentum, uh, uh, letting guys uh, feel positive about it. There's there's two ways it can go uh, there. How do you keep the momentum and the energy up, the excitement that, hey, they're, they're making progress? We'll also talk about uh, kind of the lineups. I know uh, we've seen some different lineups here, game to game, trying to find the right combination and uh, talk about the kind of the theories behind that. And... Um, and also teams, you know, kind of needing to reinvent themselves as the season goes on. So we'll kind of address those three things here. We've got Terry Porter on the horn. I uh, hope everybody is driving safely out there, uh, intermittent snow, and uh, it's supposed to freeze here tonight. So we hope everybody gets home careful, and uh, we will continue on the conversation here with head coach Terry Porter. This is the Terry Porter Coaches Show on 910 ESPN Portland. The sophomore transfer from Southeast Missouri State. Missed it. Pilots have a chance to tie. 15 seconds to go. Here's Marcus Shaver, Jr. Step back three on the angle. God, we're tied at 56. 6.1 seconds. Portland's out of timeout. Wirtz turns the corner into the lane. No whistle. We're going to overtime. <laughs> and the officials are going to talk. And we're going to play five extra minutes. Marcus Shaver Jr. with a three to send it to overtime. The inside story on Portland Pilots basketball. This is the Terry Porter Show on 910 ESPN Portland. Here again is Jason Swigard. Welcome back in. 719 here. Head coach Terry Porter uh, safely tucked away to avoid the elements uh, tonight. Joining us on the phone for the hour, uh, as you heard there, uh, our call uh, sending it into overtime there in Santa Clara. The pilots come up short in the extra period, 69-63. But, uh, Coach, I think the main thing is uh, kind of the aftermath of that. You've got all week to think about what almost was, what could have been, and making sure the guys in their minds uh, understand that they're making progress. They're right there at the tipping point. The victories are about to come because I also can see the other side where – you just feel like you got kicked in the gut and whatever remaining air in the sails there were might have been sucked out of them. How do you make sure to keep a positive spin on, on the trip to Santa Clara? Well, I, I think this, we talked about post game. It was just uh, all the things we had talked about. We got enough to a great start. And so we have to realize how important that is for us going forward. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, in regards to us ability to move in the ball pretty good, um, you know, sharing the ball, that was something else we talked a lot about coming into that game, and that was so important for us to try to get into it or put ourselves in a position to win a game. So those are the certain things we talked about in regards to prepping going into that game we were able to do and execute. And those are the things we have to continue to do. And um, the shot's going to fall, the plays are going to fall, and then that's going to take us and carry us over where we can get that first conference win. Yeah, a couple of themes uh, continued, though, in there, and, and I'm looking at the stats for, for conference play that, that have just got to be head scratchers with uh, the team free throw percentage around 65%, three-point percentage around 28%, and that's even with Marcus Shaver, who's firing at 48%. Uh, when you go back, and you have you ever been around a team, either in your playing days or coaching days, that – you know they're good shooters. You've seen them shoot it before in games. You've seen them drill them all in practice, and for some reason they're not going in in the games. Yeah, I, I'm not you know been involved or seen a stretch where it's been this many games. Obviously, you can see one or two games, and you know both free throws and shooting um, at the three point land was I would say would been a couple of our strong points. If you, someone would have asked me that at the beginning of the year, but what a reason we haven't been able to consistently find a rhythm to either one of those games. And it's been, from a free throw standpoint, it's been some of our better free throw shooters at times too. And so you get, you get to, uh, you know, situations where you feel that you have the right guy up at the line. And then it's just a matter of him, uh, you know, getting up there and being focused. But uh, sometimes that's a domino effect and it just, it spreads. When one guy starts missing, everybody starts missing. And we got to, you know, for us, we got to be able to knock down our free throws. We, we've been involved with games that, you know, every point counts for us, and we got to be able to step up there and um, convert those three those free throws, especially when, you know, some of those are, are front ends of one-on-ones, and, and we come up empty on the position. That, 
again, as you try to close out uh, games on the road, you need every one of those shots to go down at the free throw. And so that one of the other things we've seen, I think each of the last four or five games, uh, you utilized a different starting lineup. Obviously, some of that has to do with uh, the particular matchups of an opponent, where the you know you need to be bigger, be smaller uh, for matchups, or where you think you can have an advantage. But uh, as you try and search, I know that that's uh, not your general nature. You would prefer to have kind of a set uh, rotation in, in starting five. What is it? What are you really looking for uh, in this search? To you know, obviously that group got off to a good start at Santa Clara. Um, is that something you think you can uh, continue with that group? Or what is it that you really, really are looking for with that starting five? Well, sometimes it boils down, you know, is, is our opponents playing too big, so they're playing small, well, we can play small, because we still think small lineups sometimes our best offensive lineups. It gives us the best chance to get off to good starts. Um, but another time it's been, um, you know, certain guys have been playing pretty good. It's that two or three game run, and we think, hey, it's just, it's his turn to have a chance to be a starter and see how that affects uh, the group as well. Um, you know, and so we, we're really kind of moving back and forth different guys. Um, you know, our bigs have all had their chances, and I think uh, they've kind of found their role. I think um, D um, and Theo are, you know, a pretty comfortable starting at times. It depends on which way we're going to start and then, uh, Hugh, I think, has found a pretty good spot coming off the bench, being that guy to kind of help us with some offensive scoring punch off the um, in the low box off the bench. And so that's kind of found his role. And then, it's, you know, the perimeters are all about, you know, who's playing well, who, what's, what's the combination we can use that we think is going to be good for us. Um, so it's really only, you know, we've only been going like two or three spots, and some of it depends on our opponents. But um, – you know, we look at we look at situations that we're going in every game. Well, and now uh, starting to turn it around, going uh, at teams for the second time. We'll talk about BYU and Loyola Marymount, but as we get into the second half of the season, and obviously you've got now some recent, um, you know, tape and in video to look at from those games. Uh, how much will that determine uh, with the lineups moving forward on the second time around? Well, it'll be, it's going to be important. I mean, we start looking at, okay, what was the, how did we start the game? Uh, did our big lineup or did that particular lineup do some things for us early on, you know, in regards to getting good shots? You know, did we convert the shots? Maybe not, but were they good shots? Did, did that lineup turn the ball over a lot, put us in a lot of bad situations and bad uh, possessions? And, um, you know, then we would look to, see what other lineup we can go with to try to make sure we don't duplicate <laughs> the mistakes we made the first time and see if we can do a better job the second time around of, of turning some of, the, uh, some of those uh, errors that we didn't do a good job the first time we faced our opponent. And, of course, uh, we talked about uh, Pepperdine making a concerted effort to to throw waves of defense at Marcus Shaver Jr. Uh, he came back, and certainly he had the, uh, the confidence uh, still there, hit the – Game tying shot in regulation ended up the leading score uh, against Santa Clara with 15 points there, a uh, six of 16 from the floor, three of seven. Uh, how how has he responded, and and how important was that Pepperdine game for him to understand? There might be more teams that decide to go that route, and they're going to just send waves and waves of guys at him, maybe bigger guys to get physical with him. So uh, he's better equipped to handle that and and be able to understand what teams are doing. Well, yeah, all our guys have, uh, you know, non-conference play is one thing. You know, you don't get a chance to have um, uh, have a library, so to speak, on guys. And then when conference play starts, they, they know what happened last year. They kind of get a sense of what guys' strengths are, and then they get a chance to kind of, as the conference play goes on, they get more and more uh, film on guys, and they, they scheme and really like ways to kind of limit their effectiveness, at least kind of take away some of their uh, – their strengths and see how the players and uh, how they respond to getting something taken away. And so from that standpoint, everybody has to, uh, you know, make adjustments. Um, I think that uh, Marcus has learned that, uh, you know, teams are really sometimes in pick and rolls. They're really being aggressive if they have the personnel to do that and really try to trap them. If not, you know, they really try to get into them and force them to the rim and try to have people have second and third defenders come and, 
really shrink the, the driving lanes and try to take charges if he's leave his feet. Well, the other piece is as we start playing teams for the second time now, to, to what degree in the course of a season can teams reinvent themselves? Um, sometimes it's out of necessity where you've got key injuries uh, to guys and, and you're forced to. But in terms of coming up with uh, adjustments or different schemes to go back at, at teams, uh, how, how much of reinvention or, or adjustments can you make without – throwing off what the guys have been working on for four months already. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to reinvent yourself. Like you said, maybe if you have injuries, then you have to play maybe bigger or have to play smaller just because of necessity. But a lot of times, you know, I think teams may throw some different wrinkles in there, maybe add a different set that really is good for them um, with uh, their opponent they have to face um, going down the stretch. But like you said, there's been a lot of foundation already been built, and it's hard to kind of you know throw that out of the window because you don't get a chance to rep and get all that rhythm and timing of uh, you know your core sets or how you try to core uh, attack people at the offensive end. Is it half court? Uh, a lot of movement? Is it a lot of pick and rolls? What what are you really trying to you know do based on your own personalities and your own strengths of your of your particular squad? And so. If you don't have the injuries, you may add a couple of different wrinkles and maybe a different set. But for the most part, um, teams are um, – they are what they are at that point. Maybe they'd add a different, you know, defensive scheme, maybe do some different wrinkles that would be important for them to try to, you know, get them back um, in, into another mindset going into the second half of the season. Well, we'll, uh, we'll discuss a few of those wrinkles as it pertains to uh, BYU and Loyola Marymount coming up uh, here in a little bit. I uh, want to let everybody know the BYU two-packs uh, are still for sale. So for $30, you'll get a reserve seat to the BYU game this Thursday, plus one of the remaining home games, just 30 bucks. You can go to portlandpilots.com slash tickets or call 503-943-GO-UP uh, for more information. It'll be a late start, 8 p.m., uh, tip Thursday night for BYU. Uh, we'll be on one of the ESPN family of networks there uh, for television. And when we come back, uh, going to get Coach Porter's thoughts on this new NCAA transfer portal. Uh, football's kind of been the guinea pig, and, and we're seeing all the headlines there with these high-profile quarterbacks and, and players uh, deciding they want to go here, there, and everywhere. But for college basketball, it could be an even uh, bigger circus. So we'll get his thoughts on uh, just how closely they're watching that as the season goes on and what it's going to mean this coming off season here as uh, we've reached the midpoint of our show. Terry Porter, kind enough to uh, hang on the line with us out there uh, dodging snowflakes. So uh, we'll have him hold on with us and uh, take more of your comments as well. 503-542-0910-877-535-9100. This is the Terry Porter Coaches Show on 910 ESPN Portland. To Nixon driving against Thiel, got a piece of it. Ball tipped to McSwiggin. Pilots can run three on three. Josh, left corner. JoJo back to Josh. Steps inside the arc. JoJo now corner three. High arcer drained it. And Dave Rose wants a timeout. After trailing by 19, the Pilots have pulled back to within eight. You're listening to the Terry Porter Show on 910 ESPN Portland. With the coach, here's your host, Jason Swigard. Part of the first half comeback there, the Pilots uh, put on at BYU, and uh, hopefully they'll have more success like that. They will take on the Cougars uh, this Thursday night, 8 p.m. late tip. Uh, and again, the uh, $30 BYU two-game pack is uh, on sale now at the box office, 503-943-GO-UP. As uh, head coach Terry Porter, kind enough to uh, hop on the line with us here all night, wanted to make sure uh, we weren't out uh, sliding around out there on the streets tonight. And uh, before we get to previewing uh, the two games uh, coming up this week, I I want to get your thoughts, We you know, in the media, we've been joking about this transfer portal at this point, mostly about football. But for college basketball, you got 353 Division One teams. 
Uh, it went into effect October 15th, right as you guys are getting into practice and understanding, you know, where your head is focused on, okay, let's get this team going. The NCAA throws this thing at you. Just how much information uh, did you guys have about what was going on as you were starting the season? Well, I mean, it all stems from them um, wanting to have student athletes to have some freedom in regards to uh, making the decision and not being uh, kind of having a university have the permission to block or stop a student athlete to go to a particular university. So it's it's really stems from uh, them allowing them to have the freedom to go when they want to go, uh, still have to sit out a year. But when you put your name in the portal, what it does is it allows all the other schools to see that. Where before, you know, you had to do some searching. You had to kind of know some people to know who was going to, you know, look look to transfer. But um, as soon as um, the student athlete talks to compliance and the compliance um, tells him, that gives him the piece of paper, and then he goes talks to the coach, um, it's, you know, he's available. He's available um, you know, within the 24, 48 hours. And it just, it just makes it a little bit more difficult for coaches to try to manage uh, their rosters and try to keep, uh, you know, their team together. Well, and I'm curious how it is altering kind of recruiting as we've traditionally known it. There's always been transfers, but usually it's some sort of extenuating circumstance or uh, that. And I'm wondering now, uh, guys, maybe uh, players who traditionally, you know, didn't want to rock the boat or didn't say anything. They have a, a cleaner way to just, if they're not happy with their situation, uh, normally they might kind of keep going with it or whatever. It, they can just put their name in and say, I'm, I'm available. I'm a free agent for lack of a better term. Is it, is yeah. it, it going to turn into total chaos or is there still, I th- or is there still just people getting used to it and understanding how it's going to work? Well, I think, um, you know, the jury's still out. I don't know anybody really knows. It's not been enough. Um, hasn't been around long enough to see what the the bad effects or the uh, how bad it is in regards to, you know, kids who put their name on and then they obviously don't, may not have an opportunity to go somewhere. Um, you know, I think that some of them are allowed to go back to that school, but some of them are not allowed to go back to the pre- school previously they're, they're involved in. So you can imagine that. Uh, so the kid puts his name on the portal just to try to see what kind of interest he can draw up. And after it's all said and done, he doesn't really like that. And now he has to go back. Now he, you know, he's going to have the opportunity to go back and join the team. Um, before and it, it that would be kind of that's going to be kind of awkward. Um, um, the, the coaches and the universities do have the options though. But if a young man does or a young person does put their name on the portal, you're allowed at that point to uh, you know use that scholarship and try to go out and try to uh, you know fulfill that roster spot. It sounds like uh, for a lot of kids, it's it's a big roll of the dice. We saw this. Uh, when high school kids could enter the NBA draft directly, so many of them were going through, uh, and you wonder who was advising them, were they getting the best advice, and that's what I'm wondering here. You, you still, college kids still can't have agents. They can't, you know, uh, have a formal relationship with getting advice, and that's always the, the roll of the dice for them that – they all of a sudden end up without a place to play because they think the the, pa- the green, grass is always greener somewhere else. Well, yeah, unfortunately, that's the landscape of college basketball now. I mean, it, I think they, um, you know, kids, uh, for whatever reason, are thinking that maybe they have someone in their camp, someone talking to them that is, uh, they look at as a very important influence um, basketball-wise, and he's, He's telling them that, hey, that, that's not a good situation for you. We know you committed there, but we think it's time for you to leave and go somewhere else. And so, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things that's, um, that's difficult to try to uh, do when you talk about you're always re-recruiting your kids to try to make sure they're always happy there. Uh, you're always honest with them in regards to what their role is, how you're trying to improve their game, how the system works well to them to 
to try to develop and become the best uh, player they can be and put them in the best situation going forward for uh, any type of opportunity they may have in basketball when they leave uh, with uh, being on your campus for four years. I'm, I'm curious, uh, schools, you know, that have seemingly unlimited budgets, uh, your Dukes, your North Carolinas, your Kentuckys, I'm wondering if they'll all of a sudden we'll start to see a position come that's a full-time uh, recruiter more in the role like the NBA's have heads of college scouting where they're just going to be staring at the portal and scouting other collegiate programs separate from all the high school recruiting that you're doing. Is, is that, am I in fantasy land there or is that something that you could foresee happening uh, in, in college basketball the next five years? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, we, we look at that thing on a daily basis, um, definitely for sure on a weekly basis. Every Monday we look at it. But, you know, we have someone to look at it, but it will be someone who is totally who will be assigned to look at that on a daily basis and try to – on a day-to-day basis and try to figure out, you know, um, you know how can we go get a grad transfer? Because that's, you know, that's another important part of college landscape nowadays, college basketball, all sports. Uh, kids are transferring, and um, you're getting someone who has experience, someone who's been already kind of acclimated to college. You don't have to worry about maybe the high school kid being thrust into a situation and has to play right away. Now he can learn behind the transfer, and someone whose uh, body's matured a little bit has come to uh, your team with some uh, – some good pedigree in regards to his ability to be in playing college basketball previously. Well, it's uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, uh, year seeing this play out uh, in all the sports, and uh, we will be obviously keeping a close eye on it as uh, we finish up the college basketball season and start to get into uh, the summer and, and just see how much activity goes on in there when we come back uh, we'll talk to coach porter here get a preview second time around with byu and loyola marymount this week fortunately they're both coming to the child center uh and we'll see uh, what it'll take to uh get series splits with them as we continue on here the terry porter coaches show here on 910 espn portland the inside story on Portland Pilots basketball. This is the Terry Porter Show on 910 ESPN Portland. Here again is Jason Swigard. 745 here wrapping things up uh, on this edition of the Terry Porter Coaches Show. Coach Porter uh, joining us on the horn here tonight. Just uh, being uh, thought I was more safe than sorry. Uh, making sure he's safe out there. Hope you are all safe driving around. Supposed to get a little dicey tonight. So hopefully you are uh, headed home quick. And before we get to our previews of uh, BYU and LMU, uh, Tim from Gresham, kind enough to call in again tonight. How you doing, Tim? Hey, I'm doing good, Jason. Hi, Coach. Um, hey, good evening, Coach, Tim. Thanks for the call. Uh, you betcha. I want to wish you the best of luck against BYU. I tell you, my seatmates and I would like nothing better than to rush the court. So we keep talking about that. I know that day's coming. <laughs> Well, but, I'll be, I'll I'll be just, right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guarantee it will be down there. But, you know, I was thinking as the season's gone by, it's a tough one. Um, and you were talking a little bit about, you know, some of the players, the developments going on. I'm wondering if anything sticks out in your mind in terms of one of the players' development, either on skill set or attitude. Maybe they haven't seen a lot of minutes, but is there somebody who's – progress during the season that you've noted and particularly take, you know, appreciated? Well, I think they've all have grown some. I think, uh, Hugh has, uh, been, a, uh, had a big growth, um, in regards to him just learning how to deal with double teams, being very efficient in the, uh, in the post playing with good patience. Uh, he's been our most consistent, I think down there when you talk about his ability to score, in the post against, you know, tall, short, just really uh, has made good strides in that area. Um, and so I think that's something that's been good. And, you know, Theo has been a freshman, and uh, I think that's something that, uh, you know, you expect him up and down. But I, I would lean right now towards Hugh's ability just, you know, he's had some good games in the post and really be really, really effective in the post. And just going down there with some consistency. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed all that. And uh, I love, uh, again, uh, what Marcus Shaver's done. And, and as uh, you guys have talked during the course of this session, how their defenses are flying at him. So he's no secret out there. So, uh, that's yeah, I mean, he's, you know, you give him credit for playing as well as he's playing. You give him credit for yeah. doing that. Now you know that that's out of respect. You know, when teams do that, that's out of respect for his oh, yeah. skill set. You know, we got to do yeah. a better job and, um, you know, making those adjustments, and he's got to do a better job as well. But, no, we, Absolutely. We're, uh, we're definitely on top of it, and I think he's, he's learning, and it's a learning process for him as well. All right. Mm-hmm. There you go. Thanks so much for the call, Tim. We look forward to uh, seeing you at the Child Center Thursday night, and hopefully uh, we can all rush the floor together. Let's there you it. go. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye. All right, Tim. Thanks. All right. There you go. And that will open up a line 503. Uh, five four two zero nine one zero. Still uh, time for a quick question for Coach. But uh, what will it take uh, to be able to do that? BYU in the first uh, game at Provo, uh, sluggish start there, but a furious rally at the end of the first half got you to within six, and then Yoli Childs took over in that second half. He had twenty of his twenty eight points to go with twelve rebounds. Uh, he's still number two in the conference in scoring, number one in rebounding. Uh, what uh, what will you need to adjust and and do differently to keep him under control? Well, I think first of all we have to get off to a better start than we got over in Provo. That's for sure. Um, and that's early on. We got to have the type of start we had in Santa Clara. We're making shots. We're, we're turning them over. We're getting some easy baskets to really give us some rhythm and some confidence offensively. Uh, defensively, I thought. Um, you know, he, he we did a pretty good job. Guys who were assigned to him in the first half did a good job. The second half, uh, he kind of took took over took over the game and really kind of hurt us with his ability to make some mid range shots, but also post up, and we didn't do a good enough job. So we got to do a better job on him, and uh, you know, not let uh, him get off early, uh, make it difficult for him, and then not let their guards really find any type of easy opportunities as well. And then, you know. We got to take care of the ball. We can't give them easy opportunities and turn it over at home, and uh, then that and it's just about competing. And of course, uh, Coach Rose uh, finding some different guys. Uh, Gavin Baxter, who wasn't much of a factor uh, in in our game with them, all of a sudden he gets the start against Loyola Marymount in their last game. Has twenty five and ten. Uh, Nick Emery starting to find his stroke. He had seventeen points in that game. How different uh, is BYU uh, now than a month ago when we faced them in Provo? Well, they're different to the point that you said. They've had some other guys who probably played smaller roles, and now they've been able to step up and play bigger roles and contribute at a bigger um, in a bigger manner than we had uh, seen the first time. So you have to go. Now you have to take in consideration what they're doing and what their strengths are, where you have to try to limit their effectiveness, where before, you know, you, you knew of them, they're on the radar, but it wasn't like you had uh, more uh, to say about them in the scout. But, you know, to their credit, you know, they've been given up to and they really have to, they've done a good job of stepping up. So, you know, we got to recognize that and make sure that, uh, again, they don't get into a good rhythm offense. Who does nothing comes easy for them, and uh, we are on top of our game at both ends of the floor. And then on Saturday night, it'll be Loyola Marymount's uh, coming up. Uh, we open the conference season against them in Los Angeles, seventy-six sixty-four uh, defeat there. Uh, they had five or four players in double figures. Matthias Markison, uh, seventeen and ten, double fi- a double double for him. At 7'3", 265, 70 pounds, uh, he's quite a load. Uh, looking back at things, uh, is there anything you might want to try a little differently defensively, or is it just uh, hoping the guys are seasoned a little bit now and they understand more the rigors of, of what conference play is like and are a little more prepared to deal with him? Well, I thought the first time, you know, LMU has really been known a team that really gets after you defensively, tries to do some full-court pressing and try to turn you over that way. I thought our guy did a really good job of handling that. And um, But we let, uh, like you said, we let Beck, Big Fella kind of get away from us and really be effective. And we have to do a better job on him. We have to do a better job of, you know, trying to do our work early, getting in front of him, pushing him out as best we can, and not let him get deep post-ups. And then uh, do a good job on Bateman and um, don't let McClellan 
really impact the game. He comes off the bench and really just can, can cause havoc at the defensive end. So we have to be strong with the ball. We have to make sure we make uh, good, solid passes, two-hand passes, and not let those guys get steals and get into uh, you know easy points for them offensively on the road. Well, and JoJo had a huge game there. He had 20 points. Uh, he hit all 13 of his free throws. Uh, he was fouled on three-point attempts three different times. So you hope maybe he can uh, – that'll that'll flip a switch for him, that, uh, that muscle memory, and see if he'll get him going again. Uh, I know he's been he's been doing everything, doing a lot of little things, really trying to get the offense going, but he hasn't had a night uh, where it's just been coming easy probably since that Loyola game. Yeah, that was uh, that was a game where he was uh, – and a lot of those shots, some of them came through penetration and kickouts. And so, you know, this team, they really try to do a good job of forcing you to have counters to how they like to try to take away your passing lane. So it's going to be important that we go back door and, and we make sure we use their aggressiveness against them in regards to, um, you know, going back door, trying to break them down and getting some easy baskets that way and maybe loosening up their, uh, their ability to get out and try to – deny and get into the passing lane well Loyola's just one and four on the road in West Coast Conference play uh, we mentioned uh, they did play BYU last week uh, in their last game 67 49 of BYU kind of took them apart there and so uh, they might be coming in scuffling a little bit more uh, than they were after their outstanding non-conference so uh, could be right ripe for the taking yeah <laughs> Well, we're, we're excited about having a chance to get those guys come to our place now and uh, hopefully second time's a charm for us. And indeed, you can still get those BYU two-packs, uh, $30. It'll get your reserve seat for the BYU game on Thursday and then one of the remaining uh, three home games there for just 30 bucks. You can go to portlandpilots.com slash tickets or call 503-943-GO-UP. Also on Saturday, it'll be a double header. Uh, the women will play before us. I believe that is a 430 game uh, for them. So your ticket will be good if you're coming out to see Loyola Marymount. Come early. Uh, it's going to be cold and chilly, so uh, come while there's daylight. Get yourself into the building. The pregame happy hour will be going on as well. It's military appreciation night, uh, but, yeah, it'll be a doubleheader as well uh, with Coach Sorensen's women's team. Uh, Coach Porter, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the horn. I know it's a little dicey out there. We always appreciate it, and uh, we look forward uh, to seeing you Thursday night uh, late when we take on BYU. Good luck this week. Jason, thank you for having some flexibility. <laughs> Let me do it for a remote spot. Appreciate it. And, uh, and we will uh, get after it this week, that's for sure. There you go. Head coach Terry Porter. Uh, we will have our pregame show 7.30 p.m. That'll be Thursday night uh, before BYU and the national TV audience. Uh, always a fun time there. So we encourage you to uh, get your tickets again at the Pilots box office, 503-943-GO-UP or portlandpilots.com slash tickets. That'll do it for us tonight. We'll turn you back over to ESPN Radio. Thanks to our producer, Preston Highfield, as always, uh, here in the studio. For Coach Porter, I'm Jason Swigard. Have a very good night. This has been the Terry Porter Show with the head basketball coach of the Portland Pilots. Tonight's show was brought to you by your local Les Schwab Tire Center, by U.S. Bank, Coca-Cola, by Nike, Alaska Airlines, Geico, by AAA Oregon, and by Mart. Join us for University of Portland basketball all season long on 910 ESPN Portland.